started the game against Wolves like a house on fire, but did it all become a little bit too close for comfort? We'll talk Zinchenko, Saka, Odegaard, Jesus, Declan Rice and more on this edition of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. Let's go. Hey, everybody. Hope you're good. Hope you're well. Welcome back to another live episode of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast right here on the Chronicles of Aguna YouTube channel. We are, of course, uh, available on all audio platforms as well. So a big hello to our listeners that are listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and all the uh, other relevant places. Hope you've all had a good weekend so far. I've quite enjoyed it, actually, um, watching the Arsenal and uh, watching the Arsenal impress, particularly in that first 45 minutes or so, watching Manchester United um, struggle last night was also pretty enjoyable. I have to say that. Um, and there's some games coming up today. But do you know what? I'm going to disconnect a little bit from the football today. Uh, I'm going to head out to some friends for like a sort of pre-Christmas get together. I'll be keeping an eye on what's going on, but I'm probably just going to catch up with it all on match of the day tonight. I feel like I need a day where I focus on other things, you know, family, friends, chilling out and uh, and the football we can come to uh, a little bit later on in the day once the kids go to bed and all the rest of it. Because to be honest, I think that Manchester City are going to make light work of Tottenham in their current state. I think that Liverpool um, are going to win their game. So, you know, I'm expecting our lead at the top of the Premier League to be reduced back down to one point. And uh, yeah, I don't know that I want to get my hopes up and watch that unfold. I mean, I say get my hopes up. I'm conflicted when it comes to the the City Spurs game because there's a part of me that obviously wants City to drop points, right? We're in a title race along with them and Liverpool and they're a very, very good side. They've proven themselves to be relentless um, in recent seasons and I'd quite like to see them drop some points. Spurs have been one of the sides that in recent seasons have been able to take points off them. But, you know, I also would quite enjoy seeing Spurs get for obvious reasons, absolutely trounced uh, by Pep Guardiola's side. So there is a bit of, um, yeah, there is a bit of a conflict in my mind going on at the moment with regards to that. Um, let's say a few hellos to some of you joining us in the live chat. We've got Nav, we've got Christoph, we've got Tom, we've got Steve, we've got Guna V, Evan, and we've got Jorn Helga Magnussen with us as well. Uh, we've also uh, we've also got Delisu uh, too, who says, hi, Harry, what was supposed to be a comfortable three points became quite nervy at the end. I've got some some opinions and some thoughts on this, and I'll kind of give you an oversight of of what it is that you know I'm gonna say. But you know, we'll get into it a little bit later. But was it actually that nervy? Because I felt quite relaxed. I have to say that even after the Mateus Cunha goal, I felt quite relaxed and quite chilled and quite confident that Arsenal were going to see the game out. So yeah, of course you know, the deficit was was closed. And of course, Wolves have shown this season that they're a very good side and they're capable of causing many problems. But was I ever really um, concerned? The truth is no. And that's not to be disrespectful to Wolves or or anything like that. That's not my intention here. I just, I, I trust in Arsenal's ability to defend far more nowadays than I have for a long, long time. Now, I know Zinchenko was on one yesterday in terms of some of the mistakes that he made and um, you know, some of the errors that that led to Wolves' few chances. Because let's be honest, you know, they didn't create an awful lot with the, uh, you know, if you put to one side Zinchenko's moments of, of silliness, really. Um, so, yeah, I wasn't massively concerned. I wasn't concerned as others have been clearly based on some of the, um, the reaction that I've read and listened to and watched uh, over the course of the last however many hours. But anyway, let's start off with uh, with how the game uh, panned out. Uh, we'll run you through a little bit of a, a, an overlook of the game and then we'll uh, get into uh, the intricacies of it right here on the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. Don't go anywhere. So Arsenal broke the deadlock after just six minutes. Now, I had been saying in the build-up to this one that I thought this was going to be a game where we needed patience, where we needed to you know, accept that we might not be able to break a very tough resistance down in the first 15, 20 minutes. And then we'd have to just keep probing and plugging away and that eventually that opportunity would present itself. I was pleasantly surprised when Bukayo Saka broke the deadlock on six minutes. And I was even more delighted when Martin Odegaard was able to add the second, um, just what some 
I don't know, seven or so minutes later. Um, of course, Mateus Cunha uh, pulled one back for Wolves on 86 minutes, which made it a little bit nervy uh, at the end. But were we in any real jeopardy or danger of uh, of dropping points? I don't really think we were. And again, we'll discuss that in a lot more detail later. I was, it's worth noting, one goal away from getting another spot-on Premier League prediction. I predicted the 1-0 win at Brentford and I predicted a 2-0 win against Wolves yesterday. And I even wrote in my little notebook as I was sort of reporting on the game, must gloat about predictions at 2-0. But then, of course, Wolves went down at the other end and scored. So that'll teach me. I won't be doing that again. Um, but yeah, I just I just think when you look at how the way the game went, you know, we started off like a house on fire. We were brilliant. We were, we were sharp in our movement, sharp in our passing. We were um, clearly full of energy. And, and it sort of reminded me of the Arsenal that we saw last season where they would come out the traps fast, pin people back, put them under pressure and um, and force them to sort of cave in the early stages of the game. And then from a winning position, it's just about managing the game in the right way, trying to be clinical, trying to go on and uh, put your opponent to the sword so that there is no uh, reprieve and there is no way back. It doesn't always work like that, though, football. You know, sometimes you can get your nose in front. You can have more than enough chances to win a game, but or to put a game to bed early, but just not take them for whatever reason. Sometimes it's down to bad finishing. Sometimes it's bad to de- uh, it's down to bad decision making. Sometimes it's just down to rotten luck. And when you look at some of the moments that we had after our second goal, I think there was a bit of rotten luck involved. You know, yeah, you could argue that the finishing could have been better in a number of situations, but I think when you're that close, you know, uh, you know, you can look at it and go, well, maybe it just it just wasn't meant to be today. But look. We talked a lot about strikers over the last few months. We talked a lot about whether or not we need an upgrade on on Gabby Jesus, whether or not we need to look at someone who's a little bit more clinical. I think for me, um, when it comes to Gabby Jesus, anybody that was watching that yesterday and still thinks we need to upgrade on him, I I don't know what you're watching. Because I think Gabriel Jesus was instrumental in everything good that Arsenal did as an attacking force yesterday. And that is not down to the fact that he's this prolific goal scorer. We all know he's not. But it's down to the fact that he is such a great all-round footballer and he adds so much. He does so much to connect the dots. I mean, you look at his role in the first goal. uh, You know, Saka, who's talked quite a bit actually recently about you know, struggling to find solutions to having two or three men around him every time he receives the ball. Well, if you know that you can roll the ball into Gabriel Jesus's feet and you know that you can make movement around him and that he's got the quality to find you after holding the ball up and protecting it for as long as he does, then that is massive. That is so significant and that is so important. And that's what Gabriel Jesus can do. If you look at, again, his role in the second goal played a big, big part in the build-up to that as well. And, you know, his movement and his willingness to go out towards that left-hand side and support, um, you know, the the left flank as they come forward, it creates that space in the central areas for the likes of Martin Odegaard to then drift into from the edge of the box and then apply top-quality finishes. That's becoming a trademark Martin Odegaard finish now, isn't it? But we'll come on to him in a little bit. If you think that we need to upgrade on Inketia or that we need to bring in a slightly alternative option, I actually agree with that. I just I get frustrated by the disrespect shown to Gabriel Jesus. I was sitting next to someone at the game yesterday who watched that first 20 minutes or so unfold in front of us, right? Watched Jesus obviously miss a chance um, in the second half where there was a cross that came in. Gabriel got something on it and Jesus was arriving at the far post and he just couldn't keep his effort down. And, I, and someone next to me said, well, that's typical Jesus, isn't it? He's rubbish in front of goal. And it was as if the two wonderful sort of roles that he played in the two goals that we'd scored in that game that had us essentially 2-0 up had been overlooked and ignored. And there was a, a conscious decision made to focus on him missing a chance. Now, we know he's not the most clinical finisher. He never has been and he probably never will be. Now, yeah, you'd like to have one of those players, of course, and you'd like to have the most prolific goal scorer uh, in world football because that would increase your chances of taking your chances and therefore of winning football matches. Of course you would. 
But to discount the other things that he does and, and the role that he plays in the wider picture just frustrates me so, so much. I want to talk a little bit about Bukayo Saka today as well, because for the first time in a while, and I know he's been contributing with goals and assists and all that, but that was the first time in a while that I looked at Bukayo Saka um, in the first, you know, half especially, and thought, yeah, you're at it today. You know, you're not pondering over how you're going to shake off a couple of defenders. You're being way more proactive, way more aggressive. You look sharper. You look fitter to me. And that's what I want to see from Bukayo Saka. We've been talking about it for a number of weeks now. And we've been talking about how scary it is that actually this is a kid who, I say kid because he is still a kid. This is a guy who, you know, has has got so many more gears to shift up into and has got so much more to offer, yet he's still contributing and he's still one of the most effective players in the league. So the fact that he's not at his best yet is actually scary. It is scary. But yesterday, he looked like he'd kind of got over this whole, well, how do I get around a couple of fullbacks? And and he decided to, to make a conscious effort against a back five as well. So he was often faced with the left wing back, Hugo Bueno, and then uh, Totti, the centre-back that was coming over um, as well to help out. So you know, he had a, a tough time, Bukayo Saka, in terms of what he was up against. This is a very solid Wolverhampton Wanderers side. Yet, he, he just took it on and he went, you know, you know what, I'm good. I, I'm better than these. You know, I, I'm as I'm as good as anybody in this league at the moment operating from that position. So, why shouldn't I back myself a little bit more? Why shouldn't I be aggressive? He tried to take him on a couple of times. Didn't always work, but then he'd go again. And that's what you want. That's what Martinelli gives you on that other side, that relentlessness of, you know, okay, I didn't beat you this time, but I'm going to beat you the next time. And I'm going to keep going. and I'm going to keep taking you down the line and I'm going to keep cutting inside you. And I'm going to keep putting you on your ass. And I'm going to keep, 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 keep on going until, you know, you run out of steam, you leave a gap, you make a mistake and I'll be there. And when he's got Odegaard in full flow around him to link up with and to connect with, and Tommy Asu did brilliantly to connect with them in the first half as well. Um, and, and of course, in the build-up to the first goal. And you've got, you know, the likes of Jesus in a more central position that you can look to. It just makes it makes everything easier for Bukayo Saka. And I think a lot of what we've spoken about with regards to his performances in recent times has probably been affected by some of those players not quite being at their best. Jesus not always being in the team. Odegaard not being at his best so far this season, but he feels like he's coming back into his groove. Um, but I really enjoyed Saka's performance yesterday. I thought he was way more proactive than he's been in recent weeks, and it was great to see. Um, I do want to talk about Odegaard in just a second, but before we do that, I'm going to take a few of your comments from the live chat, uh, and then we'll take a really, really brief pause as well. Let's see what you guys um, are saying. James says, yeah, Harry, the ones that say we need to upgrade Jesus ain't got clue about football. Uh, Andy Jackson um, has got a silly comment, so I'm not going to read that. Uh, RR says uh, Jesus is the best facilitating nine, is he not? But I do believe we need a proper target man rather than Eddie and Ketia to come on in certain scenarios. I agree with that. An alternative option would be welcome. A different option would be welcome. But this idea that it's because Jesus isn't good enough is, is what gets under my skin and winds me up. Because I, I think if you're an Arsenal fan and you're watching us week in, week out, and you cannot see why Mikel Arteta swears by this guy and wants him in his side and isn't desperate to go out and bring in a centre forward, then I don't know what you're watching. Like, I think that in the summer that's to come, Arsenal will probably look at a striker. I think we'd have reached the point where we look at Eddie Nketiah and we go, you know what, you're on a long contract. You've got enough credit in the bank to earn yourself a Premier League move. It's probably time we cash in on you so that we can then upgrade to a higher level. I, I, th I think that's fair. And and if I were Arsenal, that would be in my long-term planning and in my long-term thinking at the moment. Um, but at the same time, it, it's not the biggest priority we have. Like for me, I, I still think we could do with uh, another midfield player. I still think you know, we could have done with another defender in the absence of Jury and Timber. But, you know, depending on what his recovery is going like and, and how that picture looks, you might see Arsenal even delay on that. But yeah, um, I do want to take uh, a few more of your comments. Let's see uh, what else we've got. Delise, who says, any news 
on Tommy Asu's injury. We'll come on to that a little bit later uh, when we discuss uh, that because that was one of the real downers uh, from yesterday's game, one of the, the disappointments. Um, what else have we got? Uh, Delisu then goes on to say, a different option is definitely required, Harry, but not Tony for 80 million quid. I agree with that. Um, you, you've put 80 quid there. If he was if he was going for 80 quid, I'd take a punt, but 80 million, no chance. Uh, no chance. Jorn uh, also agrees, and he says it's more important to secure and strengthen our midfield than spending big on a striker. I think that's spot on. I think that's spot on. Um, Gwen Fist says, um, imagine someone like Mbappe up front against Wolves. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Um, we have been linked with him, but yeah, I, I can't see that one happening. Uh, Robert says, complacency yesterday uh, in the second half. We do not need, or, or sorry, we do need an out and out striker and Eddie needs replacing. Yeah, I think Eddie does need upgrading on. I, I agree with that. We just, we just sort of, um, just been through that bit. Was it complacency? I think sometimes, you know, in the Premier League, it can happen. You know, a, a team can go in at half time like Wolves probably did. A, a manager of Gary O'Neill's intelligence has probably sussed out where and how Arsenal were causing them problem and taken steps to stop that from happening. Like sometimes we look at it and we, we always pin it on our team and we go, yep, yeah, look, they were really sort of good and able to penetrate regularly in that first half. But in the second half, it, it kind of went off. And our first instinct, of course, as Arsenal fans and as people who follow the club very closely, we go, yeah, it, it's it's on Arsenal. You know, Arsenal didn't do X, Y, Z that they were doing in the first half. But were they allowed to do that in the second half? Because I would argue that Gary O'Neill definitely got his team in at halftime, definitely um, highlighted to his players a few issues that he had spotted during that first half. We all know He's a very, very intelligent coach and probably took steps to deal with those issues, therefore reducing our effectiveness, which, listen, it's the Premier League. You're playing against top teams every week. It can happen. Um, so I, I think this team, for me, have shown too much character, too much resilience, um, too much of the right attitude, if you like, for me to then sit here and say, yeah, but it's definitely complacency. Now, there might have been an element of that, but I, I think it's harsh to say that it was solely complacency that meant that the game ended in a much closer fashion than maybe we'd have liked. Um, I'm going to take a short pause. When we come back, we'll talk Odegaard um, in detail. We're going to also talk Zinchenko and Takahiro Tomiyasu's injury. Lots to get through still. We've also got player ratings to come a little bit later on as well and a Q&A with you guys from the live chat box. So uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be back on the Chronicles of Aguna in just a moment. Martin Odegaard, of course, scored Arsenal's second goal yesterday and looked much more like the Martin Odegaard we've gotten used to over the last couple of seasons. Um, he was lively. He was sharp. He was carrying the ball into dangerous areas. He was um, drifting into those pockets that we know he can be so effective in. And again, a lot of that comes from the facilitation, um, you know, from the likes of Jesus, of Saka. You know, you get Saka on that right hand side, he gets the ball to his feet and instantly everybody's sort of attracted to him from a defensive point of view because everybody alarm goes off, danger alarm goes off. You know, Bukayo Saka's on the ball. We could be in trouble here. Um, you know, that that is that is what happens when you've got quality all over the pitch. It's taken us a bit of time to get here, but we are here now. And, you know, Odegaard did drop off a little bit. There's no question about that. But when you've got, as I say, quality all over the pitch, when players have a drop off, it doesn't have a massive detrimental effect on the side. Um, you know, we were able to bring others in. We were able to utilise Kai Havertz in that type of area. And Kai Havertz scored the winner at Brentford and the opener in the Champions League uh, against Lons in midweek. So it's important to have alternative options uh, to be able to live with player drop-offs. But player drop-offs do happen. Like, it's not uncommon. It's not something that I would be massively worried about. Odegaard showed the energy that he normally shows. He showed the zip in his game and his passing, um, the intelligence, all the rest of it. So I was really, really chuffed with his performance yesterday. And to watch him just walk onto that ball and sweep it into the bottom corner, uh, left-footed, was great as well. Um, as I said earlier, trademark Martin Odegaard finish. I mean, 
I think he's brilliant. I've said in a recent episode, not too um, recent episode, but one that we did certainly in the last few months, that I thought he was world class. Um, and I explained all the reasons why. And uh, and I stick by that. And what I saw yesterday only reinforces that opinion. Um, you know, and yes, there's been a bit of a drop off, but hey, it happens. And let's not go crazy about it because this is a guy that's been incredibly consistent over the last couple of seasons. And um, at some point, this was going to happen. But yeah, you know, he gets the second goal. It's a vital goal. It's an important goal. And um, it's nothing more than he deserves. I also wanted to talk a little bit about Alexander Zinchenko because coming away from the game yesterday, I found myself angry with him. I remember like coming out of the ground. So I, I finished covering the game, went downstairs, waited for the interviews. We we spoke to Mikel Arteta, um, whom I asked, by the way, about Takahiro Tomiyasu's injury. His response was, he went down, he felt something. We're not sure if it was just cramp, um, but we didn't want to take any risks. Now, you guys will remember, I know I was talking about Zinchenko, I've gone off on a bit of a Tommy Astley tangent, but I feel like, let me just address this and then we'll go back to Zinchenko. You guys will remember in the preview show, I said that I wouldn't play Tommy Asu yesterday because I took into consideration all the minutes he'd had in recent weeks, the international duty, the travel, all the rest of it. And I thought that he was the one out of him and Ben White that probably needed that bit of protection. In the end, Mikel Arteta went with him. And, you know, that was something that I think a lot of people saw coming because, of course, uh, Ben White came on at half time to replace him in midweek against Lons, which was kind of an indication from Arteta that, yep, I need you fresh for Saturday. So, you know, off you come. But I remember saying to you guys that I think he needed that bit of protection because I'm always really, really wary when it comes to Tommy Asu. He's someone that has frequently picked up injuries since he joined Arsenal Football Club. He's someone that has, you know, often had muscle problems, muscle strains. And it always seems to come at a time where we seemingly overload him. And, you know, you would argue that maybe, well, he needs to toughen up and he, and it's a problem for us if someone as important as him in the squad is, is so injury prone and whose threshold of sort of, you know, when he's going to pick up an injury in terms of his workload is, is a bit low. And I agree with all of that, but we know the deal with Tommy Asu. So I'm not going to sit here and slate Mikel Arteta for picking him because that would be wrong and, and overreactionary. But I just, for me, he shouldn't have played yesterday. So you can imagine my feeling when I saw him down on the ground, holding his leg, waiting for the medical staff to come on. Part of the reason I wanted to protect him was because I think he'd be useful at Luton, where we're going to face a real uh, physical battle. I think he's the one that I would have turned to at left back for Aston Villa away next weekend. And I won't go beyond that in terms of the games that we've got coming up, but there's Anfield to come as well in the not too distant future. And these are the type of games where I don't know about you, but at least from a defensive point of view, I feel way, way more comfortable with Tommy Asu at left back than I do with Alexander Zinchenko. So. You know, I asked Arteta, he said it, he thought it was a cramp or, or they hoped it was a cramp and that more would be done. I've been told this morning that there is a concern that Tommy Asu has a muscular injury um, and that that will be assessed today and tomorrow. And the club will know by the beginning of next week. I know this is not massively accurate, uh, massively specific, but that they will know the extent of the problem next week, but there is a chance that he could be out for a number of weeks now. And that will be really, really frustrating because he is in the form of his Arsenal career at the moment. I think we can all agree on that. He's been superb, not just defensively, which we've always known um, he is, but he's been very, very effective going forward as well, which is something he's clearly worked on and they've clearly been uh, coaching into him. So bad timing. Uh, with the games that we've got coming up and and fingers crossed it isn't anything but yeah it just to me it irritated me a little bit and the fact that Zinchenko played the way that he did only reinforced my frustration and anger at the fact that Tommy Asu had picked up an injury because now I'm sitting there thinking this guy has to play at left back at Villa um, I, I'm not as worried about Luton as I am about Villa Park but this guy has to play at Villa 
And probably, if there is a problem for Tommy Asu, we'll have to play at left back against Liverpool. Now, others will say, well, chuck Jakub Kivior in there. But I just don't think Jakub Kivior looks 100% comfortable at left back. Not in the way that Tommy Asu does. And I don't for a second think that Mikel would pick uh, Kivior ahead of Zinchenko as well. So that's kind of my thinking behind that. Um, just quickly before we move on and, and we do the Zinchenko chat in a little bit more detail, uh, let me just take a couple more uh, of your comments. Eastside London says, uh, love this content, like and subscribe, people. Thank you so, so much. Please do leave a like on the video if you are watching us and subscribe to the channel if you're brand spanking new as well. It really, really does help. Given how many of you are watching right now, there is no reason why we shouldn't have 100 likes on the board. So please do like, like, like. Uh, Mitchell joins us. Um, and he says, hey, Harry, thanks for all the fantastic content. I listened to you for 10,467 minutes last year on Spotify. Wow. Wow. You must be in the top, what, 1%? Surely. Um, amazing stuff. Thank you so much. He says, I probably have listened to you more than my wife last year. Uh, here is a token of thanks. And he sends a, a very kind donation across. Mitchell, thank you. So, so much, mate. I really, 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 really do appreciate it. And um, as for the wife thing, yeah, we just switch off, don't we? That's just how it goes sometimes. Um, I know I do. <laughs> uh, thank you very, very much for your uh, support. It is very, very much appreciated. Okay, let's do let's do the Zinchenko thing. So yesterday when I left the ground, I was I was angry. I was annoyed. I was irritated by his performance. I felt like he was the cause of a lot of unnecessary stress that we just didn't need. And, you know, if we're talking about, you know, the game being too close for comfort and we're talking about the, the idea that complacency may have creeped in, well, Zinchenko certainly didn't help that case, did he, um, with, with some of the mistakes that he made yesterday. There's a part of me that goes into every game knowing that Zinchenko is a bit of a problem from a defensive standpoint. I know that. I know that if I were an opposition manager and I were trying to figure out how to hurt Arsenal, Zinchenko would be the one that I target. You look at that back line, whether it be Tommy or White at right back, Saliba, Gabriel in the middle, Raya in goal. You look at that back line and you say the weakness is Alexander Zinchenko. Not because he's a crap footballer or anything like that, but because he is someone that plays a very specific role that involves him taking a lot of risks in possession and that involves him drifting into midfield positions. Therefore, it leaves spaces, it leaves gaps. And you're therefore asking, um, you know, as a defensive unit, Gabriel to kind of pick up the slack, which can leave him at times a little bit exposed. So clearly, Zinchenko defensively is a problem and a target for opposition sites. I've seen Zinchenko playing games where he's had a torrid time against a winger. And I've looked at it and I've gone, you're not a defender. You're not a defender by nature. You're someone that's being shoehorned into that position, has been shoehorned into that position uh, for a while. I accept that you're going to be less equipped to deal with a top-class winger. It's why Mikel Arteta went with uh, Tommy Asu against Salah, didn't he, last season when we played Liverpool at Emirates. I accept that you're going to have a tough time against some of the very, very best players. And that that's not necessarily your fault because you are being played in a position where the advantages you bring are very different to traditionally what advantages a left-back would bring. And that, that is where the, the issue is. Mikel Arteta sees it risk versus reward, and he sees the reward as being worth the risk of playing a player that isn't as defensively sound as he might be or probably should be um, in that position. However, when you are giving the ball away, loosely the way that Zinchenko did yesterday, I've got a problem and I've got an issue with that because that is nothing to do with you not having the defensive instincts to be in the right place at the right time. That's nothing to do with your physical profile. That's nothing to do with the fact that maybe you're a bit of a square peg that's been plodded into a round hole. That, you know, that for me is, is a very, very different thing because if you're doing what Zinchenko did yesterday, then I'm going to start to ask you or, or, or highlight sloppiness, you know, uh, complacency, perhaps. It's a very, very different thing. 
you go back to the first half yesterday, there was a ball that was played forward. He completely misjudged it, sort of went to run away with it and ended up leaving the ball behind. Martinelli had to sprint all the way back from left wing. He did fantastically, by the way, to get his mate out of trouble then. But, you know, Martinelli's got you out of jail and you're lucky there, Zinchenko, because nobody's talking about about Zinchenko's mistake there. The, the highlight from an Arsenal fan point of view is the brilliance of Martinelli, the work rate of Martinelli, and the fact that he was able to get back and pinch possession. Then in the second half, um, sorry, at the end of the first half, there was another moment. Zinchenko comes across, Saliba seems to be ready to deal with the situation, and Zinchenko comes across and goes to play it back to David Raya, but plays the pass too short. And Huang runs through and out comes David Raya, who I thought in this instance, by the way, did brilliantly. And I'll tell you why. Because a lot of goalkeepers would have tried to dive in in that situation, would have tried to either dive down on the ball. Um, I can't remember. I think he was. Was he just inside his box? Regardless, a lot of goalkeepers would have tried to, you know, get there ahead of the forward and make the first contact. Whereas David Raya remained calm and remained composed and instead focused on making himself massive and making sure that the ball could not pass him. And that's different because if you try and make that first movement, um, you know, to, to get something on the ball to clear your lines in a situation like that, where it is very, very finely balanced, it only takes a slight mistiming of your action and you've given away a penalty, you're sent off, whatever. In doing what David Raya did shows to me, again, one of the reasons why I think that Arteta has gone with him. I've said to you guys before uh, in recent weeks that I'm starting to see that his sort of calmness and composure is probably something that Mikel Arteta quite likes. And that does lead to, a lot of the time, better decision making. So when he comes out, realises the precarious nature of the situation he finds himself in, and he just spreads himself and makes sure that the ball doesn't pass, I think that was... That was brilliant and, and really, really good goalkeeping. Delisu says uh, Raya kept his nerve, but Huang fluffed it, to be fair. Yeah, Huang should have done better, but David Raya certainly reduced his chances of being able to work the ball past him because of the way he approached that situation. So credit where credit is due there. And then, of course, their goal comes from Zinchenko, again, getting caught in possession. Three really sloppy moments. And look, to sit here and say that that's, common Alexander Zinchenko would be a lie because, you know, Zinchenko is not sloppy in possession. Zinchenko is very good with possession. He's very safe in possession. I trust him more than most in Arsenal colours to receive the ball in a pressured situation and have not just the technical ability, but also the, the, the composure in his head and in his mind to be able to, you know, to make the right decision and, and get his way out of that situation, play his way out of it. So, I'm not going to sit here and say that Zinchenko does this every week because he doesn't. But I do think that yesterday we saw the, the very best of Zinchenko and the very worst of Zinchenko in the same game. Superb in the build-up to Arsenal's second goal. Instrumental in the build-up to Arsenal's second goal. But certainly responsible for the conceding of Arsenal's, uh, of Wolverhampton Wanderers goal, I should say. And so, yeah, I mean... I did come away from the game thinking, oh my God, get him out the team. I don't want to see him play at Villa and all the rest of it. But the more I've thought about it overnight, and this is why it's probably better to do podcasts the next morning, is actually I'm not massively concerned because this was clearly Alexander Zinchenko having an off day rather than a problem that I think we're going to have to face every single week. I think had he been torn a new one by a winger, then I maybe would have looked at it a little bit differently. But because I thought generally defended quite well, but for a couple of sloppy moments in possession, I do put it down to an off day at this stage. But I think we all know that there will be games where he's not the answer at left back. And we'd have to sacrifice what he gives us in midfield to be able to, to sort of um, to plug that hole from a defensive point of view. I do think that when Thomas Partey returns, another very, very good progressive passer from deep, that Arsenal probably won't need to have Zinchenko in the side as desperately as they do now. But I, because I, look, I, I love Declan Rice and we're going to come on to talk about him in a bit, but I don't think he's the best progressive passer uh, around. I think he's more of a carrier um, and I think he's very, very good at that. But yeah, we'll get into that 
um, in a little bit more detail, uh, maybe some other time, But because uh, today I just want to wax lyrical about Declan Rice because he was that good. Um, on Rice, I thought he was immense. I thought he was brilliant in every possible way. He was strong. He was quick across the ground. His decision making was excellent. Um, you know, hardly put a foot wrong in any way, really. It was a really, really strong display for him. And look, nobody's talking about the price tag. Nobody is even mentioning it, which is amazing because it says a lot about how good he's been. Uh, it says a lot about the fact that nobody's looking at that and going waste the money in the way that they're looking at Enzo Fernandez at Chelsea, for example, in the way that they're looking at, you know, Anthony at Man United. Big, 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 big money signings that just haven't done it. Declan Rice has come in and he's had an immediate impact, which again is why uh, Arsenal were willing to go that extra mile and pay what they did for him. But yeah, really, really enjoyed his performance. I'll just touch on again, I'll circle back to that point around whether it was all too close for comfort and, and, and all of that stuff. I watched the game back in full this morning and okay, you, you know, you you watch it back knowing the outcome. It's, it's very, very different. Um, but yeah, you watch it back and you know it's um it's sorry i'm getting distracted by my kids waving at me from the from the house um one of them is uh trying to swing from the door handle which isn't uh, isn't great get lost <laughs> um anyway look you watch a game back um and and you feel like you know you you, you can you can focus and analyze it on it that little bit more because you you don't have that emotion. You, there isn't that jeopardy. You know what the outcome is. But when I watched it back, it, it even it just reinforced what I felt after the game, which was it wasn't actually that close. Wolves didn't create anything. We're never really going to. Um, and uh, and maybe we just got a little bit hot under the collar if it was possible to get hot on a cold day like that for really not not very many reasons. It's just it's just my opinion. That's why I've not overreacted um, to the fact that they did manage to half uh, the deficit. Right, look, we're going to take uh, some of your questions after the break. I do uh, want to, uh, of course, um, give you my player ratings as well. Uh, so if I give you a few minutes warning to start dropping your questions into the chat box, we'll take a short pause, we'll return with the player ratings, and then we'll dive into the chat box for some uh, Arsenal uh, chat of course um yeah be back in just a second welcome back to the chronicles of aguna the arsenal podcast part of the 90 min football family um right player ratings time and i haven't done these ahead of time by the way i've literally got my little pen and paper in front of me so i'm going to write them down as i go um let's start with david raya I didn't think David Raya was very busy. Obviously, he didn't have that much to do, but everything he did, I think he did with a calmness and with an assurance. Um, I think for me, he is starting to find his feet at Arsenal. He's starting to understand the instructions, and but for some really bad defending from Alexander Zinchenko, and a great finish, really, from Mateus Cunha, you have to say that, he'd have kept yet another clean sheet. So I'm going to give David Raya... A seven out of ten. Uh, Tommy Asu, I'm going to give Tommy Asu a a seven out of ten as well. Um, I thought he was really, really good in the first half, both defensively and offensively, um, and obviously he played a big part in the build up to Arsenal's first goal. So he'll get a seven for me. Saliba gets a seven as well, solid defensively as always. Did get caught out once, I thought, in the second half, and he had to commit a foul around about the halfway line, for which he went into the book but a, a generally solid performance from him. Same with Gabriel, seven uh, for the two centre-halves then. Zinchenko, I'm going to give him a four. Um, three really bad errors, in my opinion, during the game. He was fortunate uh, that he only got punished once. Um, did play a massive part in, the, of course, the second goal, and for that he deserves a lot of credit. I've already said we saw the best and worst of Zinchenko in one single game, but because of the three errors, I can't give him more than a four. I'm sorry. That might sound harsh. Declan Rice, I'm going to give Declan Rice an eight. Um, again, you know, imperious in midfield, really strong, um, really powerful. 
stopped a number of uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers breakaways before they really sort of developed into anything. Sometimes not even by getting a foot on the ball, sometimes just by being there and bumping someone and stopping the, the, I think I heard someone put it on the radio as stopping the purity of the movement. I think it was Jason Cundy that said that on TalkSport that, you know, the way he was bumping into people or, or, or stepping into the right spaces, it just aff- impacted on how pure the move was, which causes a little bit of a delay sometimes uh, in a team sort of passing pattern, which then allows defenders to get back quicker, get behind the ball and, and obviously then reduce the danger. Leandro Trossard, I'm going to give him, I'm going to give him a six and a half. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure about Trossard in that position. You know, I know that when you're chasing a goal, it, it makes sense um, to have one of our more forward thinking players playing in that left eight role so that they can get up and support. And I know that in a lot of games, you'll look at Declan Rice at, at the base and think Declan Rice is so good that he can hold that position almost by himself with the support of Zinchenko coming in field, with the support of Saliba and Gabriel behind him and with White or Tommy Asu tucking in as well. But I just think that Trossard from the start in that position, it just doesn't work for me. He was really unlucky in the first half not to score. There was a ball pinged into the box. He, he did brilliantly to control it. And as the keeper come out, he, he on the stretch tried to just poke it past him. And what he needed to do was lift it over him, but much easier said than done. But six and a half feels about right for me with, uh, with Leandro Trossard. Martin Odegaard, I'm going to give him an eight because I thought he was back to his brilliant best. Scored a brilliant goal. Uh, but also really set the tempo. The energy levels uh, were there again from the the Norwegian, and I was very, very impressed with his performance. Bukayo Saka, I'm going to give him an eight as well. Broke the deadlock um, with a a well-taken goal. A little bit fortuitous in the way that the ball sort of broke for him, but I thought he did really, really well um, and generally had a very good game. Martinelli, I'm going to give Martinelli a seven. Um, Might sound a bit harsh, but I thought Martinelli was was uh, was wonderful yesterday in terms of, well, I thought he was wonderful in terms of his energy levels and his work rate, but his decision-making wasn't always quite right. And sometimes he tried to execute things that just weren't going to come off. There was a time in the box where he tried to do like a Zidane turn and uh, and he just didn't even make contact with the ball as he spun around, as he sort of pirouetted. Um, yeah, not as good as Saka, so you'll get a seven for me, but certainly not bad by any means. Jesus, I'm going to give Jesus an eight and a half. I would have given him a nine if he'd managed to take one of the chances that came his way. Um, but I thought his his role in the build up, his role in everything good, pretty much that Arsenal did was was um, was worthy uh, of this kind of rating because he was just so instrumental to it all. And again, I don't want people to, you know, to. To, to sit there and, and focus on the fact that he maybe should have scored himself. I want people to focus on the good that he did, which obviously and ultimately in the end led to us winning the game. So those are my player ratings for the starting 11. Let me just run through those once again for those of you listening to us. Raya 7, Tommy 7, Saliba 7, Gabriel 7, Zinchenko 4, Rice 8, Trossard 6.5, Odegaard 8, Saka 8, Martinelli 7 and Jesus 8.5. So uh, those are my player ratings from Arsenal's 2-1 victory over Wolverhampton Wanderers. Get your questions in very, very short pause, and we'll be back to rattle through them here on the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. We've got a couple over on X as well, I think. Welcome back to the show. Don't forget, if you haven't done so already, please do leave a like on the video if you're watching us. If you're... um, not subscribed what are you doing Uh, stop watching a video on a channel that you're not subscribed to stop being a freeloader i mean it is free to watch them even if you're subscribed but you know what i'm trying to say uh make sure you do that it really really does help and if you're listening on audio then please do uh, leave us a review as well because that helps too um let's take a couple of questions i think uh from x before um we uh, we dive into the chat box here. I'll give you a little bit longer to get some things or some questions in. Mark Blondal said, Ramsdale to Newcastle now that Pope is injured. And if so, how highly do we value him? So in an ideal world, I wouldn't want to sell uh, to Newcastle United. But if Aaron Ramsdale was really agitating for that move and they were willing to stump up big money, then I'd probably consider it. Because obviously, in Arteta's mind, Raya is the better goalkeeper. So why would he have his nose put out of joint if Ramsdale went somewhere else? 
you know, you don't want to strengthen your rivals, but sometimes you have to believe in the players that you have. And, and, and if it me makes financial sense and it's going to allow you to upgrade in another area or allow you to take your team to the next level, then you have to deal. And, um, you know, I look at Ramsdale and I just think, you know, he's fallen out of favour for a number of reasons. I don't think all the noise around it has helped him. The noise that's been coming out of his camp, I mean. I just think for me, if we paid around 30, 35 million for Aaron Ramsdale, he's on a, a contract as well, a decent contract because he was um, given a new one not so long ago. I'd be looking for in excess of 60 million. Now, if Newcastle were to come with a 60, 65 million pound offer for Aaron Ramsdale, which is a lot of money for a goalkeeper, then I'd sell him. But anything less than that? Nah, I'd be looking at selling him elsewhere where there isn't that direct competition and accepting less money. I think for us to sell to a rival, and by rival, I mean another club that will be fighting for the Champions League places, another club that, you know, have aspirations of going on to the next level, then, you know, you don't want to supply them with a component for that unless it's going to benefit you. And to get 35, 40 million pounds when I could get 30 million pounds from a team in the bottom half of the Premier League, it isn't it isn't worthwhile. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't make enough sense to me. It doesn't it doesn't attract me or or tempt me into doing that deal. So I'd be looking for big, big money from Newcastle um, if that is where he's to end up. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know how that goes. Um, would Newcastle be desperate to bring in a goalkeeper? I mean, if Nick Pope is out for a long time, maybe they'd rethink that. But Aaron Ramsdale's very problem is that he doesn't want to be in a side where he's competing for the number one spot. He wants to be somewhere where he knows he's going to start to fight for his place for England and, and going into the European Championships next summer. But to have Nick Pope at the same club, I, I think that would kind of be like joining a club where David Ryer is, in which case, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't make an awful lot of sense to me. Um, let's take one more uh, from X as well. Uh, Gary says... If there's if money was no object, then what Thomas Partey replacement would you want and why? I mean, if money was no no object, I'd want a Chuamani or a Camavinga or a um you know uh you know one of those guys and I'd have Rice sitting and I'd have one of those, particularly Camavinga playing in a slightly more advanced role. So that that's what I'd do if money was in fact if money was no object, I'd go and get Rodri. Right, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's dive into the chat box over here then. Uh, there was a really good one from Trev who says, uh, Harry, you go for a Sunday roast. What do you have? Beef, lamb or chicken? Ho, ho, ho. This is a proper question. This. Um, I I'm Greek, so I'd rather have a barbecue than a Sunday roast. But if I have to have a Sunday roast, then I'm going to go for... I'm probably going to go for lamb. I, I, I do really, really enjoy lamb. Um, it always feels a little bit heavy on my stomach, though. Like every time I eat lamb afterwards, I'm a bit like, oh, food coma. Um, but I do really, really enjoy it. So I'd rank them lamb, beef, and then chicken. Chicken just feels a bit like normal, like a little, not normal, but well, it is normal. Yeah. How am I phrasing this? Chicken feels like a kind of day to day meal for me. And I feel like if I could have, beef or lamb that is a bit more special and sunday's supposed to be a special day so i'd probably put chicken at the bottom of that pile yeah i do like chicken on like a day-to-day -day basis i eat quite a lot of it but um it wouldn't it wouldn't trump any of the other two for me if we're talking about in the context of a sunday roast <laughs> um right what else have we got uh, amira says is it just me or has Zinchenko been left on in games longer this season? Even if Tommy's playing, Kivior's been more than fine at left back. We all know what he brings, but the minutes have to be managed. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably down to what Arsenal have had available to them. You know, generally speaking, I think if Jurian Timber was available, I don't think Zinchenko plays as many minutes. And I think that because there have been fitness issues with uh, Tommy Asu this season, with White this season at times, it's probably been a conscious decision taken by Arteta that he needs to prioritise managing those guys' minutes than, than anybody else. Uh, Adam says, if Timber is fully fit, should he and Tommy Asu be our fullbacks? I think that's incredibly harsh on Ben White um, and Zinchenko to a degree, because as I said earlier on, Zinchenko brings a lot. It's just not what you traditionally expect from a left-back. 
And that's where we struggle with understanding it sometimes. Now, Arteta, as I keep saying, will have made that decision that actually what that e- what that equals and what he brings is worth the gamble um, that he takes with uh, with sort of the the exposure that that creates for someone like Gabriel, maybe. But I mean, Timber, I think, would have continued playing this season. Um, barring an injury, obviously he did get injured, but he got injured so early first game at home to Forest. You know, had he had he continued um, from left back and continued to play like he did in the Community Shield and like he did in the early stages of that one, I'm sure he'd have been in the left back position, and it would have been then been on Alexander Zinchenko to be, uh, you know, to to be knocking on the door and trying to displace him. I think it would have been great if we had both those options available. I'm hopeful that he'll be back, you know, sort of February ish. Um, I don't know, you know, how likely that is. Uh, I don't understand the full, um, you know, extent of the injury, but also then the recovery process, how far along he is to be able to give you sort of a really, and I don't have the expertise to be able to give you an accurate, a more accurate statement, but I'm hopeful that he can play a role in the last few months of the season. Fingers crossed. Okay. Uh, Temi says, Patino scored again. Thoughts on his performances for Swansea this season? I think he's looking good. I think he's looking good. I think he, he, he'd have toughened up playing down in the championship. He plays in a side that plays very good football, albeit they haven't always got the results this season. You know, he could have a future at Arsenal, but if he doesn't, then he certainly pushed his kind of stock up in terms of what he's worth. And Arsenal could then potentially sell, cash in, get their money and use that money on somebody else. So Either way, him having a, lo- a good loan spell benefits Arsenal. Do I look at him, though, and think, yep, absolutely, he can come into this Arsenal team straight away? No, I don't. Um, I'm still not sure whether I would bring him in as a squad player. So like, it's not like, you know, you look at, I don't know, um, let's take, for example, William Saliba, right? And I, I wasn't totally convinced myself. I'm not going to be a liar and pretend that I was. I wasn't totally convinced about William Saliba when he was out on loan. I thought he looked good and could be one, for the squad, but I didn't think he'd come into the side and have the impact that he had. With Charlie Patino, I, I I don't feel the same in terms of, yep, he will definitely slot in the squad. And therefore, if I can't say that with any real confidence, I, I can't say that he'll be a, a fixture in the first team. Therefore, if a good offer comes in, it's probably one of those where you go, yeah, let's have the money. See you later. Okay. Um, Right. What else have we got? Let's take one more um, before uh, we go off uh, and, uh, and and chill out on this uh, cloudy, cold, miserable Sunday. I'll tell you what, it's not as cold as it was yesterday, um, which is good news. But I wish it was the other way around. You know, yesterday I had to sit out in the cold from 1 p.m. until about 5, whereas today I don't have to do that, not even for a single moment. So, yeah, I wish it was the other way around. But anyway, Um Pork with crackling, that's your choice, says Andrew. Oh, I don't know, man. I do like pork on the barbecue, um, Cypriot style, but yeah, roast pork, I'm not a massive fan of. I mean, I'll eat it, but yeah. Uh, let me take uh, one more of these questions. I'm just trying to pick one that isn't really uh, a, a repetition in any way of, of anything that we've discussed. In fact, they're all pretty much uh, along the same lines as the things that we've discussed. So, you know, what? we'll leave it there. Uh, for today. Thank you so, so much for joining me as always. Like, subscribe, you know the drill by now. Turn on the uh, notifications icon on YouTube if you haven't done so already. That way you never miss a video. We've got loads coming your way over the course of the next seven days. We've got a preview show uh, coming up tomorrow. Looking ahead to Luton, we're also going to have the debrief uh, as well dropping um, across the next couple of days. So there's lots and lots um, to, to focus on, lots to watch, lots to listen to, depending on what you're doing. Um, I know it's a busy period for everybody now with Christmas coming up and, you know, it, it can be a, a difficult time. So um, if you are feeling a little bit stressed or anything like that um, and, and you know, you, you can talk to someone, please do. Because, you know, I, I'm not saying that, you know, I, I it would be disingenuous of me to to say that I'm feeling depressed or anything like that because there are people that have got, you know, a, a genuine issue with it and, are really genuinely suffering. But I do always feel at this time of year a little bit overwhelmed, you know, particularly when you've got sort of young kids and you sort of relied upon to to make Christmas special for them. And, you know, you got to buy them or, or you want to buy them. You don't have to, but you you want to buy them 
um, as as good a gift as you can. You want to make sure that everything's done well, but you've also got work to juggle and you also know that, you know, financially it can be a little bit tricky and a little bit difficult. So, you know, if anyone's feeling the strain of it around this time of year, um, you know, I understand it. I get it. And and all I would say to you is, is chat to someone. And listen, the material things at Christmas, you know, they're nice, but they don't really matter, do they? Like the important thing is that you're with your loved ones and and, and that trumps everything at the end of the day. So, yeah, if you're struggling, um, please do reach out to someone and, and talk to someone because, um, you know, you'll realize that it ain't all that important, really. Anyway, I will catch you all soon. Thank you so, so much for joining me. Until next time, have a good one and goodbye. <laughs>